Hello everyone, my name is Mogwai and I am the Nilfgaard Faction Ambassador. So, you want to play Nilfgaard? Good choice, my friend. In this video, I'll be going over the basics of Gwent and I'll be teaching you how to play the Nilfgaard starter deck. So regarding my totally unbiased view towards the greatest faction of them all, how would I briefly define Nilfgaard? Well, Nilfgaard is basically the spy faction uh, in Gwent. Whether you're infiltrating the opposing ranks with actual physical spies and cards, or whether you're obtaining knowledge uh, of their hand and or the top of your deck, Nilfgaard is a faction that utilizes said knowledge as a weapon, as a means to alter your sequencing and as a way to obtain victory. There are three major archetypes in the faction that do this, and they all play out in quite different ways. Uh, if we take a look at the leaders here, we have Emirvar Emrys, Morvren Vorhis, Jan Calvate, and the Usurper. Emir is more seen for Nilfgaard spy variants, and is perhaps the most complex leader to play out of all these, and personally my own favorite, praise Emir Sama, my senpai. <laughs> As we have Morvren Vorhis, who is the reveal leader, which can provide you with very strong tempo swings in the initial portions of the game. John Calvate, which is more of an all-around option that happens to be the face of current Alchemy Nilfgaard. And the Usurper with the Create mechanic, which enables you to create any sort of leader and perhaps one of the most fun and uh, chaotic at the same time uh, options to go for, which is viable really in all archetypes in my opinion. So without further ado, let's take a look at the starter deck and... I'll explain how it works and all that, and then we'll go on from there and showcase off the deck in action. And I'll finish off this video by giving you guys some pointers on how to improve said deck as you move towards and progress in the game. So let's hop into it. All right, let's take a look at the Nilfgaard starter deck, which is built around John Calvate, one of the four leaders that I mentioned prior. Sitting at five strength, John Calvate has the following ability. Look at the top three cards from your deck, then play one of them. Now this is a very solid leader for beginners as his ability is very intuitive, but it's also important to note that John Calvate is one of the most powerful leaders in the current metagame in Gwent and sees plays at all levels. So his ability is very straightforward, but it's really solid as you're able to look at the top three cards, choose the card that best uh, suits the current situation you're in, and you play it on, on top of five extra uh, strength points, right? But not only this, John Calvate gives you knowledge, very valuable information actually, in regards to what cards lie at the top of your deck. And this is very important when you're thinking about Nilfgaard as a faction, as there are multiple cards that benefit quite a big deal from this. Uh, and uh, one of them is actually in this uh, starter deck, and I'll go over it as, you know, I go over the entire deck. So we have a a gold, silver, and bronze core here. And I'm gonna start off with the bronze core. I'm gonna explain every single card individually and how they synergize with each other. And I'll give you some tips and tricks onto how to pilot this deck efficiently and onto what the win condition is. And what I mean by win condition is the, the sort of combo, the sort of play that you wanna go for in round three and how to build up for that round and all that. So first of all, let's talk about the bronze cards. Uh, we have the Infiltrator, AKA Mr. Creepy here, who's just like lurking and watching always. Sitting at 10 strength, he has the ability of toggling a unit's spying status. This means that when the infiltrator enters the board, you select any unit you want. If that unit is a normal non-trader unit, basically doesn't have the spying tag, you can convert it into a spy. It betrays its own kind. Or it can go the other way around. You know, he can talk with a spy and convince them that his ways are wrong and, you know, tell him to not spy anymore because it's bad. <laughs> what I mean by this is that you can select a unit that has a spying tag and you can opt to remove the said spying tag and convert it back to normal. So the infiltrator can go both ways in that sense. It's a very important card for the Nilfgaard uh, spy archetype, which is my own personal favorite, just saying. And it's a card that has a lot of synergies with, throughout you know, the faction itself and has a, a predominant synergy in this particular build which revolves around the Deathwind Arbalest. Deathwind Arbalest is a seven strength unit, which has the ability of dealing three damage to an enemy. If it's spying though, it will deal six damage instead. So if you play the Infiltrator first, you tag uh, an opposing unit with a spy tag, and then you play the Deathwind Arbalest, you'll be hitting that unit for six damage. And this uh, goes a long way as six damage is quite a lot and it enables you to basically tag with the infiltrator, certain units that your opponent 
uh, plays that could be problematic throughout the match, either due to ongoing effects or, for example, resilient tags like dwarves. Uh, like the Mac um, Defender, for example, is 6 strength. You can tag it with the Infiltrator, and then you can follow it up with the Deathwind Arbalest, and you can take it down in one hit. Uh, it's you know very important to note that that's how these two cards work, and that's the major synergy for the Infiltrator in this build. But as you progress and make this deck better, which I will explain how to uh, later in this video, you'll see that there's more synergies aligned for the faction for the Infiltrator. It's actually a very key card, right? We have the Combat Engineer, which is a 6 strength unit that boosts an ally by 5. Uh, it's Telling new players how to distribute strength because it's not good to pack it on one big unit and a solid uh, option at keeping certain uh, units alive as well. We have the Alba Pikeman, which is a three strength unit, which has the ability of summoning all copies of itself when you play it. So generally you want to preserve one Alba Pikeman in hand and two of them in your deck so that when you play Alba Pikeman, preferably in round one, you pull the other two copies of the Alba Pikeman from your deck and you have a nine strength play that also happens to thin through your deck by two cards. Deck thinning is very important uh, for Gwent. Take note of that. <laughs> and it's also a card that has very good synergy with one of our silvers in Commander Zorn, which I will explain once I get to that card. Uh, then we have the Emissary, which is a spy. So you're playing two strength points that are going to the opposing side of the board. So you're giving your opponent two strength. And you're paying that price to look at two random bronze units from your deck, then playing one of them. So initially, this is a card to uh, help you with some uh, consistency when it comes to this deck. But uh, it's has way more synergies later down the line if you venture into the archetype of Spy Nof card where Emissary is actually the heart and soul of that deck and does more than just provide you with consistency. Like it also, it actually provides you with positive value, believe it or not, even though you start off by giving your opponent two points. There are so many cards that benefit from you generating spies on the opponent's side of the board that it ends up working out in your favor. And in a rather good way and last but not least we have first light so we do not lose to you know hazards decks like uh wall hunt Erden with their frost they sure love their white frost and their christmas even though white frost is probably not associated with christmas but yeah they they, they love that stuff so we want to be able to counter it and uh, this card does that very well you boost all damage allies under hazards by two and you clear all the hazards from your side if you're not facing a Hazards deck, then you can just play a random bronze unit from your deck by spawning Rally instead of Clear Skies. Very key card that I suggest you hold on to, and uh, it will help you in, in those scenarios, you know, so you don't fall to the to the white frost, you know, eat the yellow snow, as they say. <laughs> uh, here I am with prophecies. All right, let's go on to the silver cards. I'm going to start off with the Manticore Venom. Uh, which is a very straightforward card. Uh, it deals 13 damage. It can give you straight up 13 point uh, value, or it can be used to eliminate a rather resilient unit that could be problematic, as 13 damage is a lot of damage onto one card. And it's good against dwarves and certain matchups on top of that. Commander Zorn, which is what I mentioned prior, is a card that will represent 15 points if it gets its full value as you can boost five units that are adjacent by three this means that they have to be next to each other so commander's horn uh basically aims at one of the three rows so the reason why it has a good synergy with the Owl pikeman is because the Owl pikeman uh fills up one row with three units as it's played instead of just one so with, with cards like Alba Pikeman, it's very easy to set up that row so you can command your horn and get the full value from it, which is, is very solid. 15 points is, is pretty solid. As we have Dudu, who is a doppelganger, if you're familiar with the lore, and has the ability of copying the power of an enemy. Yeah. I kind of like doppelgangers do, right? Dudu is a good way for beginners uh, to learn how to capitalize on very proactive, greedy plays from the opponent. And it's very important to know how to time this. You have to be patient with this card. Uh, preserve it for later portions in the game so that you know you can copy something very big and kind of mimic the value that your opponent just generated, right? Especially if they're like they're focusing on buffing one unit a lot, then you can punish that with the likes of Dudu. Uh, and these three silvers are way more key. Uh, as they they synergize a lot more with the faction and are gonna stick in your deck for quite a long time honestly roach we all know roach she is uh Geralt's best friend whenever you play a gold unit from your hand summon this unit she's four strength so roach basically is a unit that you never want in your hand you want her to be in the deck so that when you play a gold card she comes out of the deck and gives you four extra point value which is very very nice and helps you a lot with uh, initial tempo plays we have joaquim the vet this is a card that i mentioned when i was talking about john calvate one of these uh, cards that synergizes with that information that you have in regards to the top card of your deck 
at the current moment is because of his volume ability. He's a five strength spy unit. So when you play Joaquim, you're playing five strength on the opposing side of the board, which initially is very bad. You're giving your opponent five points, right? But his ability uh, makes up for that, and it does a pretty good job of that. You play the top non spine bronze or silver unit from your deck, and you boost it by 10. So you're getting a unit from your deck, you're boosting it by 10, and you're making up for that five point value that you gave your opponent. So inherently, Joaquim is whatever's on top of your deck plus five points and has inherent synergy with the Deathwind Arbalest, which uh, if it's pulled out by Joaquim, it can directly just kill Joaquim for betraying the Empire and provide you with a 17 point swing, right? But that's not what we're gonna aim with uh, Joaquim. We're gonna, this is a component of our uh, round three finisher combo, which I will go over as we talk about the gold cards. Uh, next, we have Cantrella, which is, the, is a card advantage spies. Every single faction has one of these. And Nilf card benefits a little bit more than other factions from card advantage spies because we do have cards that synergize with spies. Initially, in the starter deck, again, we have the Death One Arbless, which will deal six damage to Cantrella in a, instead of three. She draws you two cards, you keep one, and you move the other to the bottom of your deck, which is very solid. And when it comes to card advantage spies, this is one of the initial questions a lot of beginners have. How do you, how do you play these cards? Why do everybody play... Yeah, why does everybody play card advantage spies when they are basically negative uh, tempo plays? You're giving your opponent 13 points. Well, it's because of card advantage. You generally want to play the likes of Ken Torella in a round that you do not intend on winning. So if you manage to win round one and you're in round two, that's where you can play Cantarella so you can force your opponent to keep playing into that round because he has to win it himself and you can set up the right uh, length for round three so that your combo uh, proves to be more powerful than whatever your opponent has left. And that's the true utility of uh, card advantage spies. They enable you to get card advantage over your opponent and punish them uh, f and you know compensate you at the same time for winning round one. Uh, th there's more complex things to Cantrella, but that's something that you got to pick up as you play more and more. And But that's the general consensus when it comes to card advantage spies and why they're so important to Gwent uh, and why you see them in a lot of decks. And in regards to our gold lineup, we have Royal Decree, which has the ability to play a gold unit from your deck and boost it by two. So it basically searches whatever gold card we want and uh, plays it and gets that extra boost, which can go a long way. And we have a a couple of uh, very basic gold cards here that are very solid for beginners in Geralt of Rivia, which just represents 15 power, which gives you information in regards to what the average stat line for gold cards are, and that is 15 strength, and that's something that Geralt will always provide you with, and Triss most of the time as well, as she also represents 15 strength points in total, but distributed between, you know, her body and whatever she hits, 10 strength onto her and 5 strength that you can deal to whatever you want, even units of your own, because there are certain scenarios, certain cards that you would uh, want to interact with this uh, this way, right? So these two cards are very straightforward and are very, you know, very solid on their own. They're going to represent consistent value and Triss does help you control what the opponent is doing quite efficiently, but they're also cards that you may want to, you know, replace for more synergistic components as you progress and, you know, try to make this deck better, right? And here's the most important card of the deck, the win condition, uh, the card that combines with Joaquim. It is Rainfarn of Atra. It is a five strength gold unit which has the ability of playing a bronze or silver spine unit from your deck. So you can go for uh, Rain Farn into Cantarella if you really need that card advantage spy as you won round one and you want to ensure that you get your card advantage back. Or uh, you can play him with an emissary and search for a bronze card. But the best case scenario and what you really want to work with, your win condition with this deck, is the way you win the games is preserving uh, Rain Farn for round three, a short round three, in which you search for Joaquim and uh, you combine them that way. You go Rain Farn into Joaquim. So you put five strength on your side of the board, five strength on the opposing side of the board, and then you pick up the top card from your deck. And if you pick something like the Deathwind Arbless, for example, we would be looking at a 22 point swing, which is very strong. 24 if you search him through Royal Decree. And that's very difficult to overcome in a short round. So that is what we're going to try to aim to do with this deck to win our matches. We want to preserve Rain Farn as our last play. And everything else is 
there to get us to that point. Let's get on to that match, shall we? All right, here we go. We're facing off against Bruver Hoog, representing the Squaytail faction. Got to teach these dwarves the way of the Empire. As we're looking into our hand, and we see double Alba Pikemen. We never want more than one copy of this card. So it's going to be our first mulligan. And I also want to explain very briefly the uh, blacklisting feature uh, in Gwent. In the mulligan phase, if you mulligan a card, you blacklist it. So that means that if I mulligan this Alba Pikeman, I will 100% ensure that I get I draw no more Alba Pikemans throughout the remainder of this mulligan phase. So we start off with that because we only need one copy of them in our initial hand as we will pull the other two when we play this one. Now, looking at the rest of our hand, we want to get rid of uh, Deathwind Arbless. We have too many copies of that. And we see Roach. Roach is another card that you never want to have in your opening hand. You always want this card to summon itself from the deck. So it's going to be our last and final mulligan here as we get an Infiltrator. So pretty decent looking hand here. We have a component of our win condition here. So our late game plan uh, here in, jo in Joaquin. Let's get this over. As our opponent opts to go with... Uh, Geralt, Royal Decree onto Geralt for a nice initial swing. And we have the likes of Dudu, which can capitalize on that. But again, we're going to be uh, very patient with Dudu because dwarves are known for their buffing. So we want to hold on to this card and not, you know, jump the gun with it quite yet. As what we're going to do here is we're going to have a more modest opening than our opponent. And we're just going to lead off with the Alba Pikeman to thin through our deck, get those two copies out of there so that when we go for John Calvate, we have a higher chance of pulling something more valuable. As our opponent just proceeds to buff Geralt. And I'm just looking at this, this doo-doo. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. So what we're going to do here is we are going to actually wait one more turn. Because he could buff this unit again. And then we can play doo-doo. Let's be patient. Because there is no sense of rush right now. As we do have our card advantage spy in our hand, so if you were to force us to go down one card to win this round, we can always play this in the next round that we do not have to win and set up the round three that we won regardless, right? So we're going to be patient here. And uh, what we're going to do, what we're going to do is quite simply just go for our Royal Decree and go for our own Geralt. Gonna stack this in the melee row. So that we're not vulnerable to the likes of Geralt Digny, which is a well-known gold card that can hit uh, rows that are 25 strength or higher. So we want to put Geralt of Rivia in a different row than these three cards so that we have him alone in the melee row so he's not vulnerable to that kind of removal. And he just keeps on buffing him, as you can see. As you can see. So we're good. we're still going to preserve the Infiltrator because he could run Mackham Defenders as well. So we want to be able to counter those. And uh, I think, honestly, we're just going to play... We, we're 13 points behind. So we're just going to be subtle about this. And we're going to play a Deathwind Arbalest nice and hit choice. this Mackham Guard. We do not want to hit this unit because we're very happy with uh, how much strength he's putting onto that. As uh, he, he... Okay, he opts to buff this. Now that he's dispersing his strength more... We'll just capitalize on him with Dudu here. And uh, even though this will give him a huge Geralt Igni if he does have it. Hmm. This is dangerous because if we copy that, we could get blown back. So we're going we're gonna to be patient with this. We're, we're going to be patient indeed. What we're going to do is we're going to play John Calvade here. And we're going to put him in the, siege, in the siege row. Because if we do get Commander's Horn... We will be able to target that row immediately. We did not get Commander's Horn though. So what we're going to do, we want this as our win condition. We know we're going to draw this. So that's very good information to have as we know we will 100% be able to apply our, our strategy for round three. So what we're going to do now is we're going to play an Infiltrator. And uh, we're going to play an Infiltrator in this row. To, again, playing around the likes of Geralt Digny. And we're going to tag you. And this enables us to get ahead by two points. So even though we have Dudu as a very reliable source, we are going to wait out a little bit. And there it is. See, that's Jarpen Zigrin. That is a resilient unit, which means that it will carry over a strength in the next round. And uh, we're going to say no to that. We are going to say no to that. Now, he's used a lot of buffing already, so... If I play this, it'll only be eight, eight points, and I'm, I'm two points behind. So I want to stay ahead of him still. But the only way I do that is with Triss Marigold. So, hmm. We're going to do we're gonna do that regardless. We're going to play Triss. 
And we're gonna, we're gonna hit him by five. And get Roach out of the deck as well, which is very important. We wanna play uh, Triss here to get Roach out of the deck as well, which will thin through our deck even more. <laughs> as he just opts to play those guys, and they buff Jarper's Zergen all the way up to six. So, now what we're gonna do is we're going to aim... We're, we're gonna bait the Geralt Digny if he does have it. We're gonna place this unit on the melee row because we have a bigger unit to, to use anyways. And we're gonna, we're gonna play the Infiltrator. Bait out the Geralt Digny so if, if he has it, he goes for it. And he, and he kills the 17 strength unit. Uh, as he just opts to go for uh, the Marching Orders instead. But we wanna do that so that he doesn't buff this, but he does buff it. Ooh, that's pretty strong. We, we wanna take that down now. We definitely want to take that down now. So we're going to play the uh, Deathwind Arbalest. Going to hit it by six. And then going to follow it up with a Manticore Venom to kill it. It's nice that he uh, sent his buff to that. Oh, there's the Geralt Digny. So we did not manage to bait our opponent right there. But now that he's played the Geralt Digny, we can play our own doo-doo here. And we can copy that 34 strength boost. We've been patient with him. We waited for him to get this out. That's why it's important to be very patient with these cards. And now look at this, ladies and gentlemen. 11 strength, 2 armor. You know what card breaks through that perfectly? Our Manticore Venom. And we deny the carryover. And we get 20 points ahead of our opponent, which will most likely force a pass out of them. There we go. And we set up for round 3 in a beautiful Rain Farn card that we will draw right now. It's all setting up great. And uh, I'm going to go over this mulligan because it's very important, especially if you're in this uh, sort of scenario in which you draw into Rain Farn, but you have Joachim in your hand as well. Because you're in full control here, you want to actually preserve this card in your hand, right? And uh, you can mulligan something else like the Deathwind Arbless, for example. The reason we're doing this is because we want to preserve uh, this card as our last card. We want this to be... Uh, our last card to Mulligan for next round. So we're going to play uh, Cantrella here. Let us see. All right. And uh, we're just going to pick up the... Hmm. We, we have to keep track of how many uh, bronze cards are left in our deck. We have uh, one Deathwind Arbalest and triple... We still have triple Combat Engineer left, so we're fine. We're, we're actually going to take uh, this Emissary. No, we, we don't need the Emissary at this point. We'll just take uh, the Infiltrator. Yeah, we don't need the Emissary at this point. We don't, we don't need deck thinning. So we're going to put the Emissary at the bottom of our deck, and we're going to keep the Infiltrator in our hand. What this does is this basically makes it so that our opponent, uh, we ensure that we can push as much as we want. So we're going to go for a Rally here. And uh, get out our Deathwind Arbalest, and basically keep pressuring our opponent a little bit more. As we will set up for a nice and, and you know, round three. Oh, buddy, you played the carryover on us. So we got a little bit punished there. So we're going to get out of this round now. Basically, we've set it up uh, as long as we need it to be. We don't want him to play more Mackham uh, defenders and get more carryover for round three. Because that six strength is going to be translated into the next round. And we have our win condition. And this is the good enough of a length of a round for it to uh, truly shine. As... Right now, uh, we have just enough tools to thin through our deck entirely, or mostly entirely, and we set up the, the late game, as I said, as he plays another Mackham Defender. See, this would have gone down the prior round if I didn't pass that turn. So what we're going to do here is we're going to play the Emissary, and uh, we're going to pull a Combat Engineer, which is a little bit of a, you know, of a bad pull to make, but we're setting up so we have the last Combat Engineer pull from here. As he opts to go for a decoy and uh, just buffs this up to nine, as we are going to basically play if our infiltrator and tag this. By and we're going to finish it off with Rain Farn. We, we're in a very dominant position right now because we were, we were able to get uh, one card over our opponent. He plays his last card, which is Scorch. As we Rain Farn here into Joaquim, you guys are going to see the power of this sort of play. As you can see right there, that was a total of. Uh, 21 points. You know, not as strong as the, as the Deathwind Arbalest pull, but pretty solid as we're able to defeat our opponent 10 strength points ahead uh, while still having our last card in hand as uh, we take the round and the match overall like that. And that's basically what you want to uh, attempt to do with this deck. You want to try to build up for that Rain Farn onto round 3, and you want to use your other tools to basically 
take round one. And the shorter the round, the more impactful a card like uh, Rain Farn onto Joaquim will be. And, you know, that's generally the strategy that you want to take with this deck. So, having that said, let's move on to how to make this deck better as we progress in the game. All right, so you've seen the deck in action. And now you're probably wondering, how can I make my build better? As I progress through the game and I get more cards, uh, what direction should I take? And that's what I'm here for. I'm going to guide you a little bit as to what cards you should aim to craft. And it depends on what archetype you aim to build. So when it comes to Nilfgaard, there are three major viable archetypes right now in the metagame. And those are Spy Nilfgaard, Alchemy, and Reveal. So depending on which one uh, you want to go for, uh, if you want to go for Reveal, for example, you may want to uh, switch it up to Morvrant as a leader. And if you want to go uh, towards Spies, John Calvate still works really well, even though Emir is a nice different take on it, but a more complex option. So if you're still a beginner, I'd recommend you stick with John Calvate. And if you want to do Alchemy Nilfgaard, then John Calvate is also very fine as it is. It turns out John Calvate is a very fine leader, so you know, no, no initial reason to replace him, honestly. As... When it comes to the actual build, there's definitely like a lot of different directions to take. So if we're looking at Spy Nilfgaard, let's hover over the Bronze Cores first. Uh, when it comes to Spy Nilfgaard, you want to preserve the likes of Infiltrator and you want to get a third copy of uh, Emissaries as well. But you also want to be looking at these two cards. The Impera Brigade, which is a 6 strength unit, as you can see, boosts himself by 2 for each spying enemy and boost self by two whenever a spying enemy appears. So this is what we like to call an engine, okay? A card that has an ongoing effect throughout the entire match, and a card that synergizes really well with the likes of Emissaries. And on top of that, you want the Impera Enforcers, which is basically the reverse uh, version of Impera Brigade as it deals damage for each spying unit that appears during your turn. And it also has an initial effect of dealing two damage as it's played onto the board. So these two cards are very important for the Spy Nilfgaard archetype and are the ones that I would uh, recommend you to go with. And for them, you would replace the likes of the Combat Engineer and uh, the Alba Pikeman. Uh, as you move on and progress more, you want to search for the likes of Nazica Brigade and Vicovaro Medic. Vicovaro Medic should be your main replacement for the Deathwind Arbalest, as Vicovaro Medic enables you to resurrect a bronze unit from the opponent's graveyard, which most of the time will be an emissary that you send down there. And there's other, you know, options, as, you know, Assassin is a good option for more control variants. But basically, the initial cards you want are those. When it comes to uh, Alchemy Nilfgaard, you want to be looking at the likes of Vicovaro Navis, which will enable you to search for two random Browns Alchemy cards in your deck, thin through them, and also, you know, select which one you need for the right scenario. Uh, look into cards like Ointment, which is very important as an Alchemy card. It's very good for the archetype. And Macam Ale, overall, it's also very, very solid, uh, too. And then, uh, on top of that, uh, you generally want this card. The most important card for the Alchemy archetype is the Viper Witcher, as it deals one damage for each Alchemy card in your starting deck. So, a card with a lot of potential when it comes to power level, but said potential comes with a price. And that price is paid in the process of deck building, which is what makes Alchemy uh, a cool archetype, really. Like, you have to kind of sacrifice... Uh, some deck slots just to make your, you know, your cards like Viper, which is stronger. And then when it comes to Reveal, uh, you want to focus on the likes of Mangonel, which is a unit that will deal two damage whenever you reveal a card. And uh, the likes of Imperial Golem, which summons itself from your graveyard whenever you reveal the card in your opponent's hand. And Derlin Foot Soldiers as well, as you can reveal this unit. And it is played onto a random row and you draw a card on top of that. So those are the most important cards when it comes to reveal. And you take a very different approach from this deck. But again, you aim to take out... Uh, when it comes to reveal, if you're not playing Spy Nilfgaard, you don't need the Infiltrator. So that's a card that you would also look to uh, remove as the other options are better. Like It depends on what direction you take. But those are the initial cards that you want to aim for. And also the likes of Fire Scorpion is also very, very important for the reveal archetype as well. So you, you have different uh, bronze cards here that you can opt to go with uh, depending on what you want to build. When it comes to the silver slots, I highly recommend you keep Cantorla, Joaquim, and Roach for quite some time uh, as they are extremely reliable. And honestly, they are seen in pretty much the most decks at the higher ranks. They're just very key silvers that you're lucky enough to start off with. And you opt to replace due to Commander's Horn and Manticore Venom, depending, again, on what archetype you build. If you're building alchemy, then you want silver alchemy cards, such as Mandrake, 
uh, expired ale and the likes of the Dasbok runestone. If you want to build some spy nerf guard, you have to look for uh, getting your your hands on Kalak different, which is a very very solid uh, tool for spy nerf guard as it enables you to spawn an extra copy of an emissary and has inherent synergy with the likes of Mirvar Emrys as well. Iris is also a very solid option for spy nerf guard as she gives you. She has the potential to provide you with a 25-point swing on her own, which is really solid. And also, she procs all the spy components and really promotes the synergy very well. Uh, cards like Van Hamar are really useful for all archetypes as they enable you to combat hazards. And Strike also has to have inherent synergy with the spy archetype as you're playing a lot of the small uh, units on the opposing side of the board. So it's easy for you to have enough targets to get the full value out of this card. Uh, when it comes to... Reveal uh, Nerf Guard, you definitely want the likes of Rygef to be able to play uh, a, a Mango now from your deck. Uh, it's very good at that because it provides you a very solid swing with a very strong setup uh, too. And those are the main cards you want to aim for. There are more uh, complex options like Azire, but uh, she's more for she's best reserved for more experienced players, even though she has good synergy with the likes of Roach. And there's a lot of, you know, ways you can go, but those are the initial uh, silvers that I would personally aim for. And last but not least, when it comes to the gold slots, uh, very high, you know, recommendation for Kahir Different as he's a very strong gold that will enable you to resurrect your leader. Not really uh, a card that I would recommend in Reveal, but if you want to play Spy or Alchemy Nof Guard, you definitely should be going with Kahir as he's very, very solid. Being able to utilize John Kavit and or Emir is uh or emir sorry is super key uh you also have um the likes of uh vesemir mentor if you want to go the alchemy route uh you have uh, leo bonart for reveal is a good option as well uh meno Koehorn is super solid for spy nof guard as he has an extremely good synergy with the infiltrator right here as you can tag any unit with the spy status and no matter how big that unit is Meno will 100% kill it. So in that last game that you guys saw, we could have used Infiltrator onto the 37th strength Geralt and then played Meno onto that and, and just completely wipe out that 37 uh, strength point from the board, which is a very massive deal. So Meno is something that I highly recommend. Uh, Vilgoforce is a very powerful uh, gold option as well that you can go for. And those are my initial recommendations. And of course, Vaytir for the reveal archetype as well. Uh, you generally want to replace the likes of Geralt of Rivia and Triss initially. And then if you get more gold quality, you may be looking to replace Royal Decree. While well, Rainforn is a card that you can honestly keep, as he's very solid with uh, these two uh, Silver Spies in particular, right? And those are basically what I my suggestions to make this deck better. It really depends on what archetype you want to build. You can, you know, venture into multiple archetypes as well, and you can just build different decks. That's the beauty of, you know, of Gwent, and that's the beauty of card games in general. So, uh... Yeah, take that approach. Uh, be patient with it. Uh, focus on rebuilding your bronze core to fit whatever archetype you want to push for. You got a lot of good tools to start off, you know, with. And most importantly, have fun and enjoy. And that is all for today. Thank you guys very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video and found it useful as well. If you want to learn more about the greatness of the Nilfgaard Empire, you can head on over to my channel in YouTube. It's called Mega Mogwai. And that's all I got to say. Have a swell day. Enjoy Gwent. And I'll see you guys around.